Hey, pick that up! Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Business Blaze. I am Fact Boy, your boy with the blaze, also known as Dickhead. My name is Simon, and this video is brought to you by the anti-dickheads, the true legends. Over at Surfshark, oh yes! Safety and security online are critically important, and you can protect yourself online with Surfshark. Get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below. Yo, that's a fact. Let's jump into it. This is The World's Dumbest Criminals Part 2. Because whenever I make one of these, this is why I've got to explain why. Why is it a part two? Well, the first one obviously did really well, creatively bankrupt. So I say to Danny, Danny, look, we need those views. YouTube has blessed us with another topic that is going to work. So your work's about to get a lot more repetitive. Enjoy. And uh, this is what Job is Criminals Part 2. Goldilocks on cocaine. Why is the cocaine involved? Because why not? Cocaine is amazing. Allegedly. Not, this is not an endorsement of drugs, YouTube gods. This is what we call comedy. Shit. Unfunny comedy. Let's, uh, well, Danny will write this. He has written it. I will, uh... I'm not going to sprinkle any memes. Sam's going to do that. I'm just going to read it. I'm just like the middleman. I'm the man who you want to move, remove from transactions. I can only remember once getting burgled in my life. I'd accidentally moved uh, to a flat by Morecambe Beach for a few months. That's a long and painful story. And I came home one night to find the flat had been completely ransacked. When I was a kid, we lived in the middle of nowhere. And every time we'd come back from holiday, I'd be like, oh yeah, someone's broken in and stolen some sh**. <laughs> uh, it obviously wasn't a particularly nice experience, but I was very lucky in a way that the only items that appeared to be missing were some music CDs. Ah yes, back when those had value. And the burglar clearly had very specific tastes. He was more than happy to steal all my Radiohead and David Bowie albums, but there was no way he was going to get lumbered with any Tears for Fears by Morrissey. I don't know what Morrissey sings. I have never heard of Tears for Fears. Uh, I felt as if I'd not only been burgled, but my musical brain references have been challenged and critiqued. Now this might sound like a sweeping generalization, but if you're going to get burgled by anyone at all, you're probably hoping to get burgled by a Polish thief. You're hoping to get- Oh, you're better off getting burgled by a Polish thief, okay. And that's because they tend to throw in a few extra services uh, for free as part of the package. <laughs> what is going on? That's what happened when the, to the retired couple Martin Hotby and Pat Dyson in 2014. Anyway, and funnily enough, the incident occurred not too far away from my old flat in Morecambe. Why is everything in that part of the country? Like, is this Morecambe, Morecambe, Morecambe? I don't know. Why is everything in that part of the country really hard to pronounce? as the couple lived in Burnley in the same county of Lancashire. Wait, where's Lancashire? I have no idea. My geography is terrible. It's like southeast. I know. I know where Bristol is. I know where Cornwall is because it's the, the, the pointy bit at the end and Scotland is north. Everything else is kind of a mystery to me. But whereas I had returned to find that my flat had been turned completely upside down, Martin and Pat came home to back from a short holiday to find that their house was noticeably smarter than they'd left it. It's debatable whether 28-year-old Polish man Lukasz Czernawczewski was technically a burglar at all or just an unsolicited house sitter. He appears to have helped himself to a few things here and there, but he was more interested in making himself at home and having a bit of a spring clean. When Martin and Pat stepped through the doorway, they were surprised to find that their post and newspapers had been thoughtfully removed from the doormat and stored on the kitchen table, and the whole house looked considerably cleaner and tidier than usual. <laughs> Dude, get the fuck out of my house. If I came back and my house was tidier, I'd be like, why has someone gone through all my shit? Off. That pile of that pile that that pile of mess was organized in a very specific way. My my cleaner in my office is way too diligent. She comes in and uh, I'll keep like you know I'll buy cameras and microphones and all this shit. And I'll keep the boxes you know for a little while just in case I need to return them. But she always throws them away. So I've got all this very expensive equipment, which is going to be a nightmare to return if any of it breaks. And I always forget that she's going to throw away the boxes, so uh, I don't put them in a cupboard or anything. And yeah, it's not brilliant to be honest, but it is what it is. Otherwise, I'd just have hundreds of boxes everywhere. The mystery of the self-cleaning house was finally solved when Martin wandered upstairs to find an intruder tucked up in his bed, fast asleep. Poor old Lukash had a bit of an old rude awakening when Martin started to question what the hell he thought he was doing. But the conversation proved to be a little awkward as Lukash didn't speak much English. Instead, he cowered under the sheets in fright as Martin and Pat called the police. Dude, run, go, it's time to go. Lukash later claimed that it assumed the house must have been abandoned because the garden was wildly overgrown and everything was in such a state. Ah, oh, dude, that's so rude. This might not have been a glowing review of Martin Pat's hat cleaning standards, but Pat later sniffily declared, I don't know how he could think our house was derelict. Martin has volunteered in the state manager and worked in woodland management for the last 30 years, and he liked our garden to be like that. Yeah. Alright, that 
steady on. Sounds like it's just a bit lazy, doesn't it, Pat? Uh, whatever you say, Pat, yeah. No, 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 he's, he loves the woods. That's why we never mow our lawn. But it appears that a retired couple did later display quite a bit of good humour and even sympathy for Lukash, who had been kicked out of his own lodgings in Leeds and was desperate to find a new place to call home. So he just breaks into someone else's house. Legend! And it's not like he was trashing the place. During his brief stay, he'd got the groceries in, washed his undies and hung them out to dry, had a bit of a tidy up, washed the pots and enjoyed a nice perfumed bath in the evenings. Pat told the press it was like something out of Goldilocks and Three Bears, although it was more like Baby Bear. In terms of burglars, he was the most domesticating one I could have ever asked for. Fancy washing his dishes and airing his smalls. I would have happily put him up in the cellar as our butler. I think he would have been very good at that. So Pat's essentially saying, yeah, yeah, I, he would be a good slave. It's like, Pat, you can't just have people living in your basement and working for free. Pat, you're not running business, Blaze, okay? Lukash didn't manage to keep an entirely clean copybook. It was noted that he'd been rifling through the couple's jewellery. Uh-oh. Although he hadn't taken anything, Pat also commented on how he'd burnt one of the saucepans. But after admitting to burglary and Burnley Crown Court, again a bit weird, has not stolen anything, that's because burglary, interestingly enough, doesn't have anything to do with stealing. It's, uh, entering with intent, I think, to, uh, to steal. Or to vandalize, perhaps, or break things. I, I can't remember the exact thing, but it, you, you can be a burglar without stealing. Lukash was given a two year conditional discharge in order to pay £200 in costs. This might have been for the burnt saucepan. That's a fancy ass saucepan, okay? I don't think it would have been entirely unfair for Lukash to send Martin a pound of bill for cleaning costs, say about 200 quid. But unlike Goldilocks, at least he didn't have to face any porridge. Maybe it's Danny doesn't like porridge. You learn something new about Danny every episode. <laughs> Maybe it's harsh to label Lukash as a dumb criminal, although I would have thought that you should be absolutely sure that a house has been abandoned before you start checking out the jewellery, running yourself perfumed baths, and then going for a nice nap in the master bedroom. <laughs> yeah. And also, when they show up, run. It's time to leave. Don't just hide under the bedsheets. What are you, eight? It's like there's monsters in the cupboard! But if I'm under the bedsheets, I'm okay. If you're like, going to the bathroom as a kid, you'd be like... But then as soon as you get back to bed, completely safe. Absolutely 100% safe as soon as you're under those sheets because sheets are known to stop predators. But then again, not every criminal has the time and dedication to invest in truly considering every single step of a craftily calculated operation. And I suspect that some of them just aren't really trying at all. And with that, God knows how long in, the introduction is over. I believe that's about a third of the video today. Let's carry on. No returns policy. One of the biggest problems in buying illegal products from the underbelly of your local neighborhood, say a packet of Hershey's icebreaker packs, OGBB, or a proper Kinder Surprise egg, that's only in America, it's gonna be a problem. Not that fang, fake Kinder Joy shit, is that you're not really covered by a comprehensive returns policy. And this was the dilemma faced by 50 year old Eloise D. Reeves in the Hawthorne area of Putnam County, New York in 2006. Can you imagine buying some stolen goods, taking it back and being like, yeah, uh, this DVD player, it didn't work. They'll just be like, get the f out of here <laughs> before I fing stab you, Eloise. <laughs> Remember what I taught you do this, but then stab. Miss you stab, stab, swim, swim, stab. Deputy Sheriff Jeffrey Pedrick was wandering back to his patrol car, having just dealt with a call out to a local convenience store, when Eloise D. Reeves collared him with a serious complaint that she felt required urgent attention. Eloise had just been ripped off by an unscrupulous salesman. Please tell me she was buying drugs. She handed over her cash in good faith to a dodgy bloke in a nearby car park in return for a modest serving of crack cocaine. <laughs> what are you doing, Eloise? Well, I guess the thing is, you are, you know, you're, you're buying crack cocaine. You're probably not in your right mind entirely. But it turns out she'd been fobbed off with bad shit. Eloise recognized that the crack was laced with wax, and to illustrate the point, she pulled out a rock from her mouth and placed it on the trunk of the patrol car so that the sheriff, deputy sheriff could inspect it himself and offer his expert opinion. This guy's gotta be like, like what are you doing? <laughs> this was not a very good idea. Maybe Eloise figured that her purchase was only slightly illegal if it failed to live up to the salesman's product description. But the deputy sheriff didn't seem particularly interested in getting Eloise her money back. Instead, he informed her that she would be arrested if the sample tested positive for cocaine. She was later charged with possession and released on a $1,504 bond. That's incredibly specific. Meanwhile, the guy in the car park was questioned and searched, but nothing was found, and he denied ever having met Eloise D. Reeves. Yeah, of course, he did. This must happen to them all the time. And it'd be like, you've got to have like, you've got to be set up so if the police come to you as a drug. Isn't this why they do that thing where they have the people collecting the money and the other guy with the drugs and so they're not tied? There's ways they get around this and it's pretty clever because obviously it's a big problem that they have to deal with. How about a scarf? You'll look dashing in jade. If you buy this Usyk, 
you'll have it made. We've got cold 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 Eloise, you are the dummy here. Uh, another shocking example of law enforcement officers taking the side of corporate business over the everyday consumer. Yeah, that's what we're looking at here, Danny. Meanwhile, over the other side of the Atlantic in Chadwell Heath in Essex, a group of dim-witted burglars may have spent a bit too much time in targeting the wrong bits of loot. They broke into the home of the elderly D. Blythe in 2000 to give, and to give them some credit, they got away with a couple of TV sets, a VCR, a stereo, and gems worth over £2,000. Who has gems? What's going on with gems? Number of gems I have, zero. <laughs> Does anyone have gems? Does gold count as gem? I have much, I have a lot of gold. Not really. And they don't appear to have got caught, which is a rare achievement for an entry in a dumb criminals video. So what are they doing here, Danny? But they may have got away with it, but they may have got away with even more if they didn't stop for a leisurely snort of what? Gems? During the ransacking of the house, they came across a jar of white powder, which had been helpfully labeled Charlie. Oh no, I know what's happening. I know what's happening. Charlie's like, it's the ashes of their dog, isn't it? It's like they had a dog named Charlie and they put him in a jar and they labeled it Charlie. It's not cocaine. I mean, also, who looks at, who breaks into a house, sees a giant jar of white powder labeled Charlie and be like, I mean, that's like a hundred grams worth of Charlie right there. <laughs> Like, what is going on? Although I don't think that the term is widely used in the US, Charlie is a popular nickname for cocaine here in the UK, so I'm reliably informed. It is. It is. Now, considering that they must have guessed at some point that the house belonged to an elderly lady, it seems a tad unlikely that you'd keep a nice big jar of cocaine in the kitchen cupboards for unexpected guests. <laughs> you never know. Uh, and it also seems unlikely that if you were st stashing a highly illegal Class A drug in your home, you would trouble labeling the jar with a sticker that reads, Highly Illegal Class A Drug. But that didn't stop the optimistic burglars from emptying the jar onto the kitchen table and sorting out the white powder into neat lines. Oh, good lord. It's not exactly clear how much they snorted before they realized they weren't getting much of a buzz from this shit. Maybe the stuff had been laced with wax too. But a Or maybe it didn't contain any cocaine or wax at all. It was actually the cremated remains of D. Blythe's beloved pet Labrador, Charlie, who had only recently passed away and had been temporarily placed in a jar while awaiting the arrival of the proper cremation urn. Dude, you sniffed dead dog. Fuck. <laughs> the dead shall serve. This better be good. Apparently, the police officers on the scene were in fits of hysterics when Dee explained that the burglars appeared to have been snorting Charlie's ashes. No doubt! It's all over, lawbreaker. Your spree is at an end. And Dee seemed to take it all in good humor, too. She said it was horrible knowing they were in my house, but the idea of them trying to get high on a dog certainly made me feel a bit better. Francine, can I ask you a question? Sure, anything. Why don't you go back to your own house and stop bothering I don't know, I feel a bit weird about people sniffing my dead dog. Uh, like snorting it, not like... Oh, it smells a little bit rotten. Like the uh, rotten turtle fragrance, which I will shortly be launching. That is actually happening, OGBB. Good boy, Charlie. The man who slipped up. Oh, but first, it's time for a little word from our dear friends over at Surfshark. Do you use the internet? Of course you do. You're using the internet right now. Do you use VPN? Look, I'm just thinking actually right now, before we get to the talking points, I like, I have Surfshark. And the other day I wanted to see like, because apparently below this video, if you're in America, maybe Canada, maybe the UK, I'm not really sure, you get a merch shelf, which allows you to purchase the merch, purchthemerch.co as well, of this channel. And I'd never seen this. And I was like, I'm gonna check that out. So I fire up Surfshark, I pop over to, guess where? Welcome to Miami. And I'm in Miami, virtually, of course. I mean, one, Miami's really far away and it's also go -bit. No one is traveling anywhere. And uh, I was like, wow. I looked on YouTube and it's like, I can see that merch shelf. I can see all sorts of features that I don't get. It's great. But the internet is all kinds of weird. There are people out there who want to ruin your day. They want to take your details, steal your identity. Surfshark has hack clock. This searches database for passwords, which sounds bad, but it's not. If they detect that your password has been involved in some leak or something, they'll be like, yo, you might want to change that. You might not want to use the same password for everything. And then while you're in that warm comfort safety, oh, by the way, I'd never actually tried this. I uh, use Surfshark to access, a friend of mine, who's definitely not me, uses Surfshark to access a certain BBC service known as iPlayer. Wait, this is my friend, so I can talk about it. I mean, I'm not gonna name my friends. He use it, He might use Surfshark to access a service called BBC iPlayer, which is only available in the UK, and strictly if you pay for a television license. And he uses Surfshark to watch all the shows on there. He'd never actually tried it on Netflix, and now I'll just switch to the first person. 
because this is now me, we're talking about me, I fired up my Netflix while I was using the Surfshark VPN. And I'd always been, I'd always assumed like, I mean, how much more stuff is there gonna be? And then I went on there, I was like, oh, there is a lot more stuff. And so I looked it up online, I was like, how much more stuff is available on like Netflix US compared to Netflix Czech Republic where I live? It, there was thousands of things on Netflix US and hundreds of things on Netflix Czech. And so I was like, okay, let's just see. You have all of the Bond movies. And I realize this is not selling it to anyone in America because you have the greatest selection in the world. But you could jump over to the UK or anywhere else and find some stuff that is not available for you. But for me, it's extraordinary. <laughs> oh, anyway, Surfshark is totally unlimited. So if you want to watch Netflix in like ultra 4K, which, yeah, I mean, it looks mwah, then uh, you can absolutely do that. There's also no logs so no one can see you watching Bond movies or, you know, 30 days money back guarantee if you don't like it. Get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below or just use my channel code BLAZE. The man who slipped up. I imagine that a few typos and errors have crept into the occasional business play script. Yeah, no sh Danny. But in my defense, it's not always that easy to type accurately in the dark. Danny, I'll, I'll see about passing a new candle down to you if that one I sent last month has run out already. Can't believe it's run out already. What are you doing, burning it all the time? When you're not writing, Blow it out, Danny. But if I was putting together a quick demand note, I'd try my best to make sure that everything was spelt correctly, particularly if it was only 10 words long. Otherwise, I'd feel a bit embarrassed when my victim pointed out a careless mistake. When 40-year-old man with no front teeth wandered into a branch of Fifth Third Bank, that's confusingly named, in Cary, Cary, North Carolina, in 2008, he had certainly come prepared for robbery. But I'm disappointed that he didn't apply just a bit more time and consideration to the composition of his demand note. Thomas Infante, Infants in uh, why I had scribbled out his note mere seconds before entering the bank and it read be quick be quiet Give your cash or I'll shoot. I mean, it's very to the point. I'm assuming he meant oh be quiet I even read it wrong No surprise dear. It says be quick be quit give your cash or I'll shoot um, so, yeah, um, I apologize. But when he handed over the threatening note to the bank teller, it appears that the teller didn't have the heart to correct his sloppy spelling. Instead, Thomas was handed $400 in cash before he made a hasty exit from the building. If you're robbing a bank, the penalties are going to be absolute with a- and you're threatening with a gun. The penalty for that is going to be absolutely massive. You're going away to prison for a very long time. Like, definitely years, maybe close to a decade, I don't know. But for 400 bucks? 400 bucks. However, Thomas had made an even bigger mistake with his choice of demand note. He'd actually written it on half of his own pay slip. Oh, f dude, come on. I'm gonna hear my shirt. Walter. Which he left behind at the scene of the crime. Now, Thomas was no fool when he ripped the pace up in half. He'd been smart enough to make sure that he composed his demand note on the half that didn't reveal any of his personal details. Clever man, he'll go far. Unfortunately, he'd ripped the note in half just seconds before entering the bank and discarded the other half on the ground directly outside the main entrance. Ah! I thought you were extraordinarily dumb. It turns out you're just slightly less extraordinarily dumb. So the persip. Per. Persip. Pers. Wow, this is a word I don't know. Pers. Perspicacious, perspicacious police were kicked to match the two halves and form, let's just say, so the skilled police. <laughs> were uh, quick to match up the two halves and form a complete payslip which contained Thomas's name and home address. And the long arm of the law caught up with Thomas. Honestly, a very short arm would do on this one. You don't have to reach very far. <laughs> he later admitted guilt to the robbery, but I couldn't find confirmation on any sentence he must have served. I would hope that it included a littering penalty. I know the US can be pretty tough on litter bugs. Good. I don't like people littering. It's unpleasant and I see people doing it and I don't have the guts to be like, hey! Pick that up! Because I'm not a Karen. But it also it's also like such a douchebag move to like litter, not to correct people. Or people whose dogs take a shit and then they're like, don't need to pick that up. Fuck you if you do this, you f***ing asshole. FBI spokesman Rob Rice later commented, it's fairly unusual that we see something that specifically stupid. Why is the, the FBI gets involved with this? Surely the local police could be like, it was that guy, just go arrest him. FBI, what are you doing? Don't you have like serial killers to catch and the man who defended himself. I'm always suspicious of people who point blank refuse to hire a professional to carry out a difficult job and instead insist on making an amateur hash of things themselves. But it's one thing to have a go at fixing a faulty boiler or a broken washing machine yourself. Dude, don't fix your boiler yourself. That bit will poison you to death or blow up or something. I'm like scared of my boiler. It, it's like it can gas me. It can half burn the gas and gas me. It can set me on fire. It can blow up. I mean, boilers are dangerous. Don't be fixing the yourself. Don't be a pussy. 
Broken washing machine, I mean, I guess you could tackle. I mean, I'd n I, honestly, I'd have no idea where to start. I'd be like, this is an absolute mystery. I don't even know how it works. <laughs> it's just a magical box which cleans the clothes. I have one of those washing machines that is a tumble dryer as well. So you put your clothes in, dirty, and they come out clean and dry. It's like, whoa. Witchcraft. Oh. It's quite another to find yourself on trial facing serious charges of armed robbery and to reach a decision that you can probably do just as good a job defending yourself as a money-grabbing professional attorney. Yeah, you can't. That's why they have to go to law school to learn about, you know, laws and sh**. But that's exactly what Dennis Newton decided to do in 1985 when he was accused of carrying out armed robbery at a convenience store in Oklahoma City. To be fair, he appeared to be making quite a good fist of uh, good fist of protect protesting his complete innocence for a while. Even the district attorney reported that he was doing a fair job, but he sadly lost the plot a little when the clerk at the convenience store took the stand as a witness and identified Dennis as the scoundrel who pointed the gun at her face while demanding that she empty the till. Quick as a flash, Janet, Dennis jumped to his feet in sheer indignation and roared, I should have blown your King head off. Dead. No. Just don't do it. That's almost as, that is worse than like we've discussed many times about don't write down your crimes. The number of criminals we've covered on this channel who get caught because they wrote down their crimes in some way. It's like on casual criminals as well. It's like why do they get caught? Well, they wrote down their crimes and the police found the writing down of their crimes. Just don't. Do it! This is worse than that. It's rarely something worse than that, but this is it. After taking a few seconds to compose his thoughts and consider his remark, he then meekly turned to the jury and asked, and added, if I'd been the one that was there. <laughs> Jesse should have gone there. Please, uh, disregard that outburst from my client. <laughs> Who is him? It took just 20 minutes for the jury to convict Dennis Newton and recommended a 30-year prison sentence. Oh, good lord, although it's not exactly clear how much time he served in the slammer. I imagine that every professional attorney in Oklahoma shook their heads in dismay and smugly muttered to themselves, rookie error. Florida man executes perfect robbery, foiled by sheer bad luck. Well, this is about dumbest criminals, so is it really going to be bad luck? Finally, I thought it might be nice to offer Florida Man a guest star appearance in this video and give him a rare pat on the back in the wake of all the derogatory headlines that the poor guy usually attracts. One dark night in 2018, after the bustling city of Fort Myers had long since fallen asleep, a guy called Christopher Cron, cool name, was about to put a grand master plan into action. He left no stone unturned in his meticulous planning and research. Some might have questioned the idea of robbing the same very restaurant at which you're successfully holding down a good job as a bartender. After all, you don't shit on your own doorstep. But that's rule number one. But Christopher Cron felt that his strategy was foolproof. After all, he already knew the layout of the restaurant like the back of his hand. He knew the alarm code, and he knew exactly where the money and the good stuff was kept. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the fact that immediately when this crime comes to light, they're going to assume it was an inside job and start looking at the staff. Just don't. Do it! That's what could go wrong, Chrissy boy. With hindsight, he probably should have worn a balaclava or s Dude, come on. Come on, man. Or something so that his face wouldn't be instantly recognizable on the security cameras. But nobody's perfect. Wait, how is perfect robbery? <laughs> Maybe he should have also made an effort to fully memorize the alarm code too, instead of instantly triggering the alarm as soon as he st put, stepped foot inside the building. Some might judge that Christopher made a bad decision when under the deafening screech of the alarm, he carried on casually rummaging about for a bit of booze after having completely forgotten where the money was kept. Christopher, what are you up to? And if we're re has he actually committed a crime yet? <laughs> I mean, did he break? He did break in, but then he just hangs out. He sets off the alarm and has a drink. It's like, all right. And if we're really being hypercritical of Christopher's plan, it would be in regards to what happens next. How can this get worse? The triggering of the alarm prompted a telephone call from a security company who felt obliged to check in and make sure that the alarm hadn't been accidentally tripped by an employee. The fact that Christopher stopped to answer the phone may not have been entirely balmy, as he probably felt that he could dissuade the security company from pursuing any follow-up action. But perhaps he should have used a smidgen more brain power when they asked for his name. Christopher Cron cheerfully responded with Christopher Cron. The security company grew suspicious and called the cops anyway because because Christopher had been unable to confirm the alarm code. But they arrived on the scene too late, so crafty Christopher had already gotten away with his bulging loot of a single bottle of Grand Marnier and a cheap bottle of beer. Dude, what are you up to? Please, please don't send him to prison for this. He's just, he's an idiot. He can't go to prison. He's too dumb. He's, he's going to be one of those people who's like, you can't stand trial. He's not mentally competent. However, this forgetting the alarm code business, uh, a job I used to work, I used to open up the store in the morning. And uh, one day, like after working there for months, I go in and I'm like going to turn off the alarm code as I've done every day for like the last few months. And I was like, I have no idea what the alarm code is. <laughs> you know where you just have those mental farts and you're just like, ah, uh, yeah. So it's like 5.30 in the morning, that alarm goes off. If the police had rung up and be like, hey, we're just making sure you're not being robbed. I'd be like, yeah, we're not being robbed. And they'd be like, what's the alarm code? I'd be like, I don't know. That's why the alarm went off. The police would definitely come. <laughs>
By the next morning, it hadn't taken too long for the police in the restaurant to review the surveillance footage and realize that the enigmatic figure behind this master heist was none other than Christopher Cron, and it didn't take them long to catch him either. In what might be considered his final minor oversight, Christopher strolled into work the next morning as if nothing had happened. I don't imagine that his penalty was too harsh, as he only nicked a couple of bottles of beer in the end. With a bit of a lark, he might have got away with a small fine and a few hours of community service. He's definitely losing his job as well. Let's hope that good old Dennis Newton was defending this deeply unlucky criminal in court. This has been an episode of Business Blaze. I have been your boy with the blaze dumbest criminals part two if you'd like a part three you know what to do hit the comments below or just while you watch this video to the end so i'm gonna look at the stats and be like a lot of people watch this let's do a part three also if you'd like to get some surf shark there's a link below if you'd like to get your hands on some fine beard oils beard, beardblaze.com and thank you for watching Fuck you if you do this you asshole